How's it going, Dennis? <clears throat> and Hope is here. Gotcha. Thanks, Dennis. I think you told me that before. Boy, class is awesome today. I only got two folks. How you doing, Hope? Your speaker work? Um, I think so. Gotcha. I'm good. How are you? Not too bad. Excited about another day of online learning. Hooray! I just got <laughs> my, my computer story. back from Geek Squad. It's been glitching out. <laughs> I had no problem with it except for it being a little slow and now it's just all crazy. Yeah, that's a pain. Uh, I've been pumping out videos all day, every day. It's kind of a pain in the butt, but oh well. I think I'm going to do a, a lecture again today on chapter 14, especially since it looks like I only got two people right now. Okay. So uh, we'll have that in the can and I'll, uh, Actually, I realized it comes up a lot quicker than I thought. I did a full 43 minutes yesterday, and it was available to me within uh, maybe 20 minutes. So then all I had to do was uh, download it and then upload it. Because it's kind of weird if I download if I download it uh, the studio. Well, I can't put it in studio unless I download it. And if I put it in the studio, I can actually edit it and do stuff like that. So anyways, technical problems that are just something that's not that important. You guys have any questions about anything? I, I know Dennis can't talk, but he can type if he has anything going on. No, I'm just trying to finish everything up. That's cool. So yeah, try to get whatever you can to me points wise and stuff like that. I, I should have a, a total of everything tomorrow. Uh, Hopefully I'll have it tomorrow afternoon, but it might be, you know, a little later tomorrow evening or something like that. But the main thing is I'll have it Friday. Uh, so y'all have a good idea where you're at. Okay. So, hey Tyree. If your mic don't work, feel free to type in the comment. All right, well, I guess I'm gonna go ahead and get started with this covering of chapter 14. So uh, chapter 14 is our star of the sun. And uh, I'm gonna start off reading off the learning goals. The learning goals, uh, first one is describe the balance between the forces that determine the structure of the sun. So it turns out like there's a core, and this is actually how we model the sun too. We have this core that's this small sphere, and it's not even necessarily the core, they actually break it into a smaller unit than the core. And then outside of that, we got a little spherical shell and then another spherical shell and another spherical shell. And then they set up equations saying that, you know, any matter that comes into that first shell must come through the, the boundary at the bottom or must come through the boundary at the top. Uh, heat, of course, uh, flows from cold to hot. What's the temperature here? That sort of stuff. And they've got a system of, of differential equations that are all set up to be uh, simultaneously solved and, and they literally break it up into probably on the order of hundreds or thousands of layers in the sun and uh, there's a very limited number of solutions that actually meet all those criteria and that's how they model the sun but the, one of the criteria is that the weight of everything above 
is actually squeezing due to gravity, squeezing towards the center. That has to be counteracted or else the star is shrinking. That has to be counteracted by an outward radiation pressure. So that's what we're talking about, describing the balance between the forces that determine the structure of the sun. And when they do that, like I said, it's a very uh, limited number of solutions that can be generated because of the complexity of the equations. And we believe that's sort of why we have that main sequence line on the, on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram because those are the only really rare conditions in which something can actually satisfy all those equations. So learning goal two is explain how mass is converted to energy in the sun's core and how long the sun will take us uh, take to use up its fuel. So we're going to learn about the proton-proton chain uh, and I'll tell you what part of that's most important. But the big thing is you basically have four protons coming in basically two of those protons spontaneously switch to neutrons but conservation of charge is an actual real law so that has to spit out something equally charged as a, as a positive proton and when that happens you get two protons and two neutrons uh st stuck together and that's a new an alpha nucleus uh or that's a helium nucleus which we call an alpha particle and it turns out the mass of that is less than the mass of the four protons combined and that change in mass times c squared, according to Einstein's famous E equals mc squared equation, is the energy that we get from the sun. Uh, part of it goes off as particles that have been created, uh, anti-electrons and stuff like that, and neutrinos, but uh, part of it's just pure radiation uh, from photons. We'll see that in the proton-proton chain. Learning goal three is to sketch a physical model of the sun's interior and list the ways that energy moves outward from the sun's core toward its surface. We're going to find there's you know, several regions. There's a core, and then there's a radiative zone, and uh, stuff like that. There's a, basically a circulatory area, and then outside of that is a, a I shouldn't say circulatory a convection area, and then outside of that is the photosphere, which is our atmosphere, uh, and that's the temperature that we say when we say a star is 6,000 Kelvin. We mean the surface temperature of that little photosphere. So that's learning goal three. Learning goal four is describe how observations of solar neutrinos and seismic vibrations on the surface of the sun, test astronomers' models of the sun. We're gonna see a very interesting story regarding that. Uh, it was a big mystery and uh, somebody sort of cheated and made up an ex explanation that happened to work perfectly and then turned out to be reality. So that was kind of cool. Uh, learning goal five, describe the solar activity cycles of 11 and 22 years and explain how those cycles are related to the sun's changing magnetic fields. So we're talking about sunspots and all that good stuff there. So that's what the, the uh, five learning goals are. Let me go ahead and share my screen and we'll do the PowerPoint. Make sure you ask me any questions you have. Uh, obviously, uh, if someone sees someone posted a comment, because I can't see the comment screen when I'm doing this. If someone sees that uh, someone's posted a comment, please let me know uh, because it might be someone that doesn't have a microphone. So that would be helpful to me. Uh, let me make this a little smaller, put it up in the corner. Uh, oh, I want it this way. Okay, so our star, the sun. So that's a cool picture. Uh, you can actually get this from, do a search for SOHO. That's the Solar uh, Observatory Heliosphere, Heliosphere, observatory or something uh, like that, SOHO. I can't remember what the, fir the first O is. But anyways, uh, they actually run pictures of this all day long, 24 seven basically. So you can uh, check out pictures of it and various other telescopes that, that are basically looking at the sun constantly around the planet uh, in different wavelengths and stuff like that. So that's a really cool picture. And we see these uh, big things. This is like a solar prominence, and then they break off and, and make flares. And check out the cool, you know, plasma tornadoes, if you will. They're, these are literally spikes of energy blowing out and cool stuff like that. So uh, it's really an awesome image. And especially when you realize the distance across here is 109 Earth diameters. So this is really big and you see these spots, which are more or less sunspots, they are, you know, comparable in size to the state of Texas. It's pretty, uh, actually, usually they can be even bigger, like the size of the earth and stuff like that. But anyways, so what makes the sun shine? That's what we're going to talk about now. Uh, we're going to learn about the stuff that goes on inside of it. There is a solar balance. And I, as I told you before, basically gravity is pulling everything towards the center because it's such a large mass. 
but then energy being created in some parts and we didn't necessarily restrict it to the to the actual core of the star it's just the the equations told us that's where it has to happen because that's where the temperatures are high enough it turns out for you to force four protons together you have to have a temperature of at least uh 10 uh, million kelvin and 10 million kelvin is the temperature at which the particles are moving so fast because of their temperature that two protons which would normally repel one another can actually touch in some sense uh, so yeah, solar energy production going on inside uh, creates radiation. That radiation makes a pressure and that pushes outward on the, the gravity and that's the balance. There's a solar energy transmission. So all that energy that's created has got to be transmitted not only uh, through the layers of the sun, but also through the atmosphere of the sun, which is what we call the photosphere, the corona and the, uh, uh, stuff like that. And then the solar atmosphere. Uh, then it enters our atmosphere after going through a nearly a vacuum of space. Okay, so here's the sort of picture that they want you to be able to draw. It doesn't have everything labeled yet. You'll see a section in a second that this uh, basically you have a core. This area right here is like a cosmic Plinko game. It's called the radiative zone. And basically photons and other particles, of course, but definitely photons, they're moving at the speed of light. They come out of the core as a part of the proton-proton chain. And though they're uh, photons and therefore travel at the speed of light, it takes them literally 100,000 years to get from here to here. And this is on the order of, you know, a light second or a couple light seconds, that sort of thing. So not very, not very far. It's basically just because it's so densely packed, if you will, that the thing sort of plays Plinko and bounces all around and literally takes 100,000 years to get from the edge of the core to the inside of the uh, convection zone and that's what this is right here is a convection zone and then that itty bitty thin part right there is the photosphere uh, so as i said the hydrostatic equilibrium is the outward pressure equaling the inward force of gravity and that outward pressure comes from the radiation pressure due to energy created in the core uh, deeper into the sun more material is pushing down which means gravity increases the pressure must also increase for the sun to remain in balance and pressure, of course, is proportional to temperature, if you remember your ideal gas law. Uh, so increasing pressure will lead to increasing temperature. But that's a good thing. Like I said, we have to get to 10 million Kelvin or the, the star can't ignite itself in the beginning. So once you get to that 10 million Kelvin, then you can consistently get protons uh, running into other protons so that they can take part of this proton-proton chain, which leads to nuclear fusion that drives the sun. So the density, temperature, and pressure, these are, are, are plots. This is a plot of pressure uh, in atmospheres. An atmosphere, basically the Earth's atmospheric pressure is one atmosphere. So you can see as you get uh, look closer and closer to the center, we're approaching 250 billions of atmospheres. So that's a extremely high pressure. The density is in kilograms per cubic meter. And uh, the density of water, by the way, is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So this is uh, obviously less than that, but it's still a very, very dense for a gas. Because remember, this is the sun is sort of a gas. It's technically speaking, parts of it are a plasma, meaning it's gotten such a high temperature that the electrons aren't held tightly to their nucleus. So they're actually charged particles and, and therefore respond to magnetic fields. And then the temperature, for our sun is well above the 10 million Kelvin that's necessary. It's around 15, 16 million Kelvin uh, at the core, but you see how they all fall off as you get further and further out. So the energy production takes place only where the temperature is higher than uh, 10 million Kelvin. So you can say roughly here, from here to here is the only place where the actual nuclear fusion can take place. And that's what this graph is showing. Uh, there's there's the drawing with the things labeled. So you've got the core, the radiative zone, and then the convective zone. And it's convective because literally the energy is hitting uh, the underside of this convective zone. That's heating up little cells, if you will. When cells heat up, they expand because uh, heating up means literally the molecules or atoms are moving faster. So they have to stabilize uh, farther apart. So that makes them less dense. So they float up to the top but then they give off their energies because it's colder out here. And when they go off their energy, they become more dense and sink back down. And then the process starts over again. So it is a constant convective cycle. As measured by radiometric dating of meteorites, the sun has existed for about 4.6 billion years. This means the sun must have been generating a lot of energy over a long, long time. 
All the sun's energy is created by nuclear fusion. Remember that is fusion, not fission. Uh, fusion is when two smaller things uh, ram into each other and make something bigger. And fission's where one big thing breaks apart into smaller things. Uh, the original atom bomb, if you will, uh, was in fact a uh, fission bomb, but the uh, subsequent one, what they call the super, and what we use now is actually a fusion bomb. So it actually uses a atomic bomb as the detonator for the other bomb. So it's kind of a, a lot bigger, many, many uh, orders of magnitude more powerful. Uh, but this is the nuclear reaction. That's why they call it nuclear weapons is because we're, we're forcing the uh, release of energy from the nucleus of the atom. And that's what's going on inside the star. As I said, four protons are fusing together to form a helium nucleus, which is just two protons and two neutrons. The energy being created inside and the energy being radiated outside into space must always be balanced to keep the sun stable. So there's another set of equations you can imagine that's gonna have to be uh, allowed or, or, or solved, I should say. <clears throat> So like you said, nuclear fusion uh, involves fusing of atomic nuclei. Nuclei consists of protons, neutrons. Uh, the electron's not a nuclei, by the way. It's not a, a particle of the nucleus, uh, but it's just protons and neutrons. But like charges repel, so when two protons get near each other, they really wanna get farther apart. But in order to o overcome what we call the, the Coulomb barrier, which is the force uh, all that actually uh, causes two electrical charges to attract or repel, that law is called Coulomb's law, so they call it Coulomb repulsion. That electric or Coulomb repulsion can only be overcome once the temperature reaches about 10 million Kelvin. But sometimes we see weird things occurring, like I mentioned to you earlier, two protons will actually uh, become an actual uh, neutron. That's kind of a weird thing, uh, but you can see there's all sorts of weird stuff that happens. In this case, I've got two protons coming together. Uh, one of them spontaneously becomes a proton, See, so neutron, neutron, one of them spontaneous becomes a proton, but conservation of charge says a positive charge must come out. So that creates what we call a positron. It's the antiparticle of the electron, but the antiparticle of the electron is not created unless there's a neutrino too, which as you can tell is a neutral particle. So those two things come out, but the bang is that we got one proton and one neutron instead of just two, pro two neutrons now. Uh, here we go on a little bit further. The strong nuclear force can overcome the push of the electrical force that binds the proton. So that's the weird thing. It's uh, the nuclear force is the strongest force. The strong nuclear force is the strongest of all the forces. And it, you might think it's weird. How, how come we have to have a high temperature to get the strong nuclear force to pull two protons together? Well, it's more like uh, thinking about nuclear strong forces, like thinking about Velcro. Uh, unlike a magnet, you can get two magnets fairly close to each other and it'll suck them together immediately. You can't do that with Velcro. It's actually got to be within a very specific distance. And if you look at the Velcro, it's got little loops. It's when those little loops interact with the other loops, the hooks, that is, uh, and that's when it works. So the same thing here, you have to force the protons to get so close together that the strong force can take it. And only then will it work. Uh, the fusion requires a slamming of protons together at high speed and it creates a more massive nuclei from the less massive ones, but loses the total mass in the process. The lost mass is converted to energy via E equals MC squared. Basically, it's, uh, I'm, I shouldn't be quoting these numbers on a videotape, but if I remember correctly, it's something like uh, 590, or well, let's say 600 million tons of matter every second is turned to 596 million tons of matter every second that remaining uh, four million tons is multiplied by C squared and that's the energy we get out. So again, I, I'm just remembering those numbers. I didn't get the chance to, to do the calculation again just before class. So I, I, that might be off and I, I'll update that uh, probably by email let you know exactly what those numbers are, but it's on that order of magnitude. Uh, all main sequence stars, remember we talked about those er earlier, including the sun, generate energy by fusion of hydrogen into helium in the cores. The fusion is often called hydrogen burning. It's, it's called burning even though it's not really a fire. It's called burning because the hydrogen is being consumed. It actually becomes part of something else, i.e. helium. And then the helium is what we call the ash of the burn, if you will, which again, it's not really ash either, but it is the byproduct. So here's the proton-proton chain. <clears throat> They've got all the masses worked out and stuff like that, so you can actually see that. And they do calculations with this in your book, but I, again, I don't require any of that math. 
Uh, the big thing is the mass of the helium nucleus is 4.0026, but the mass of uh, four hydrogen nuclei is 4.032. So you see that this mass going in is smaller than the mass coming out. That extra mass coming out, part of it goes to the positron, which is teeny, it's a, a thousandth of the mass of a proton. Uh, and then neutrinos, which uh, evidently do have mass, but a very, very small amount, even small compared to the electron. And then the rest is just gamma rays and, and other types of radiation, basically. So what do you need to know from this proton-proton chain? Well, this proton-proton chain, basically you see that what goes in is four protons. You'll see here it's actually six, but notice it spits two out. So really at the end of the day, it's only four going in, okay? The first two ram and do that reaction I just told you about, two protons running together. Uh, the strong nuclear force forces one of them to become a neutron, and that causes the creation of a uh, anti-electron called a positron. That positron is gonna immediately combine because antiparticles don't like their antiparticles. So it's gonna combine immediately with, a, a, or I say combine, but it's actually annihilate one another with a regular electron, and that's gonna produce two gamma ray photons, okay? But as part of the strong nuclear force, that also dictates that a neutrino be emitted. So a neutrino is emitted as well. Well, that happens here and also happens down here. So every time this occurs, uh, we should be able to find one, two, three, four gamma ray photons and one, two neutrinos, right? Uh, now those two uh, particles, which are really deuterium, they have, notice, they still have one proton, so the element's technically hydrogen, but it's an isotope of hydrogen because hydrogen normally doesn't have a, uh, a neutron. In this case, it does, and it's called deuterium because there's two particles. Tritium is it when it's got uh, two neutron neutrons. Uh, so you probably heard of tritium and, and deuterium before. That's what they make heavy water out of. So these two deuteriums now can come on. They take on another hydrogen, but remember that's going to be paid back at the end. So a hydrogen, uh, i.e. a proton, comes in, uh, hits the deuterium, and actually makes helium-3 because we now have two protons and one neutron. Since the two protons are there, we know it's helium. Same thing over here, but that produces, as a side effect, another gamma ray photon in each case. So now I can expect one, two, three, four, five, six gamma ray photons total and two positrons, or excuse me, two uh, neutrinos. Now these two helium threes can combine and that's where we get back our other uh, protons that went in and out comes a helium nucleus, which is an alpha particle or helium four is what it's called. But we just call it helium because that's the most naturally occurring. So that's what you need to know. You need to know that basically the proton-proton chain will produce two solar neutrinos, uh, six gamma ray photons, and a helium nucleus, and it only takes in four uh, hydrogen protons or four hydrogen nuclei. Any questions on that? It's a lot of words I'm saying there. Neutrinos are neat particles. We'll learn a little bit more about them later. Electrons are neat particles. That's a cool story behind that. Uh, Dirac made up an equation for quantum mechanics uh, that no one had before, but the problem was quantum mechanics before him didn't, didn't obey uh, special relativity. And everybody knew by this time that special relativity was the bomb. It had to be uh, obeyed. So he made a special relativity compliant version of quantum mechanics and he published the equation and people were like, well, the problem is this comes up with negative energies. That negative energy doesn't make any sense. And he said, well, the equation's right. And here's how I think you can interpret that. There must be particles that are the antiparticles of existing particles. And that's what happens when you get a negative energy. So he literally trusted his equation so much that he predicted the existence of antimatter and therefore anti-electrons, positrons. Uh, and sure enough, he was right. So that's kind of crazy, but that's Dirac, P-A-M Dirac was his name. It's Paul Ammer or something, Maurice uh, Dirac, British dude. Uh, this fusion process is very efficient. A little bit of mass makes a lot of energy. Uh, the fusion takes place in the core where it's hot enough to push the nuclei close together. Remember I told you the core was about 15 million Kelvin, 15, 16, something like that. At that temperature, the atoms in the core are completely ionized, so the core is made of atomic nuclei and a sea of free electrons. That's why the electrons are so ready to jump in uh, when the positron comes out. 
so that's uh, what the proton proton chain is. Let's go to the next slide if I can. So two hydrogen nuclei protons fuse to make a deuterium. That's the part I already talked about. Uh, the position is the uh, the positron is the antimatter counterpart of the electron. I already talked about that as well. Uh, the deuterium cloud. So this is basically the same discussion I just gave you, but I gave it to you in real time. They're breaking it down so you can uh, see it in written form. So that'll be helpful for you when you look later or just going through this and, and try to put together some uh, some narration or narrative of what the proton proton chain is. Uh, so in the end, we finally get the helium nucleus. Those two extra protons that came in are now spit back out. So it's still a total of four went in and uh, helium nucleus comes out. So what happens then to that energy? We found out that what that energy is. In fact, if you take the total amount of energy that comes from the sun per second, say, that's called the luminosity of the sun, and if you divide that by the energy per proton proton chain, the energy that came out of this from that E equals MC squared calculation, that'll tell you how many of these reactions take place every second. And remember I told you that gave us six uh, gamma ray photons and two uh, neutrinos. So if we multiply that, that number of reactions by six will get the number of gamma ray photons that come out. And if we multiply that uh, number of reactions by two, we'll get the number of solar neutrinos that come out. So those are things we can actually test to see whether our models are working properly. So we've got the energy. Now, how does it get out? Well, the first thing it goes through is the radiative zone. That's that part I told you is like a cosmic plinko. So the electron, I mean, the uh, particles that come out, even the photons, which travel at the speed of light, are going to go ding, 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 so uh, hotter regions are more crowded with photons than cooler regions, making it more likely that photons will move from hotter to cooler regions in the reverse direction. So the net energy transfer is always from uh, hot to cold. So heat always flows spontaneously from a, hot, from a high temperature to a low temperature. That's basically the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, energy is conserved is the first law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics is that given uh, enough time, basically heat will flow from the hotter object, the object with the higher temperature to the object with the colder temperature, as long as it's in some th sort of thermal contact, whether it be uh, conduction where they're touching or convection uh, where they're touching an intermediate uh, stuff that, that actually then touches the other thing or even radiation is another way. Okay. So this is where they're talking about the, uh, cosmic Plinko case that I talked about. And what they use, they use a word called op uh, opacity. And basically it says that that radiative zone is so densely packed that it's opaque, which is sort of the opposite of transparent. So opacity is the opposite of transparent. It's basically a measure of how easily the flow, the photons can flow through. The radiative zone extends to about 70% of the way to the surface. And like I said, it takes about 100,000 years to reach its outer layers. And that's because of that opacity of the radiative layer or the radiative uh, zone, excuse me. Uh, once we get to the convective zone, we actually see uh, basically cells that are having heat deposited from below. And because that heat's deposited, it expands. As it expands, it becomes less dense and floats up to the top. And these are little cells of that heat bubbling up these things are on the order of the size of Texas. Uh, they last five to 20 minutes. Uh, so when you actually look at the sun, this is the kind of stuff you get to see. Make sure I didn't, yeah. Uh, hydrogen fusion emits neutrinos. They're light atomic particles with no charge. They, weak, they interact very weakly. So the neutrinos are really a neat particle. Uh, since it's neutral, the only thing you can use to attract it is uh, basically the strong forces because it's not going to respond to the electric force. Uh, so you either have the strong nuclear force or the weak nuclear force. Uh, it's so, in fact, hard to stop or hard to attract that a single neutrino can pass through a light year thick chunk of lead. So literally imagine making a chunk of lead that's one light year thick 
and a neutrino will go through that. Make it much bigger, it'll start getting uh, stopped. So that, that's pretty amazing, but that's what neutrinos are. So as you can imagine, uh, neutrinos would be really hard to detect because in order for us to detect them, you gotta sort of interact with them. So when we went to test our models about the sun, like I told you earlier, you take the total energy of the sun, the luminosity, divide it by the energy per reaction, that gives you the number of reactions that occur every second. And then you multiply that by two and that gives you the number of neutrinos that should come out every second. And then, you know, you realize that they go out in a spherically symmetric way. So neutrinos go out in every direction, the same amount in each direction. We get the city bitty small section of direction that they go through. If we want to detect them, we calculate exactly how much will go through however big a detector we use. So what they did was they paid millions and millions of dollars. They built a really deep uh, tunnel down deep inside the earth. Uh, because they had to stop all the other radiation because when you find the stuff that actually does stop a neutrino it's going to it's going to pick up every other type of radiation so you had to isolate it from all the other types so they put this uh, olympic sized swimming pool uh, tank deep below the surface of the earth so they can only detect neutrinos and neutrinos just are so awesome they go right through the earth no problem uh, so they didn't have any problem with that and when they were done building it they predicted that they should see three neutrinos a day that's a lot of money spent to catch three neutrinos a day and they turned it on and the first day they got one and they're like okay well maybe we just missed the first two or something i don't know uh, so they waited the next day the next day they got one again the next day they got one again they're like ah oh, crap we seem to not understand the sun at all then someone had the wise idea what if neutrinos actually come in flavors and there's three of them and they spontaneously change to the different flavors on their way, then that would explain the one neutrino that we're getting instead of the three. And that really sounds like an ad hoc solution, like really, I'm gonna make some stuff up and you know throw some something sticky to the wall, see if it sticks. So that's what they did, but turns out they were actually right. The person predicted, in fact, a uh, that neutrinos have uh, several flavors, there's actually three of them. <laughs> I was just reading Camille's comment. That's correct, Camille. Okay, if you uh, if you uh, have three or one that can become three, then the probability is one third that you're going to get the type that you were planning for. So it does correct for it, but it really seems kind of unctuous and, and gross or whatever to to do science that way. But when they went and looked, they did in fact find other types of neutrinos. There's a uh, electron neutrino. There's a uh, I think there's a tau and a pi neutrino. And in fact, they do oscillate back and forth. So they went and spilt, spent even more millions of dollars to build another facility. And this facility could actually detect not only neutrinos, but all the different types. And this time it got exactly the right number. So we are now confident that we understand the reactions going on in the core. So that is that sort of interplay of uh, experiment and theory that you see in the scientific process. So that is kind of weird that it worked out that way. We've seen now two instances where someone just made up some crap and it turned out to be right. That's kind of amazing. Well, the other things we can use to test, to test our models, uh, in, in addition to continuing to see what comes out and what other stars do, is we do something like uh, uh, seismology that we do on the Earth. So we look for earthquakes, right? Well, we can do the same thing with the sun. It has quakes as well. Those quakes, though, are uh, vibrational of the plasma. So it's vibrations of the plasma. And we, we can use the Doppler shift to realize that, hey, all these blue areas right here are coming to us. And hey, all these red ones are going away from us. And you get these patterns. Well, those patterns are predicted by our models. And if they match our models, then we have more co uh, concrete evidence that our models are working. And sure enough, uh, they work pretty well. So we, we know the solar models are working pretty well. We think we have a pretty good understanding of what goes on inside the sun. Uh, there's still a lot of stuff we don't understand. Uh, we don't even you know, understand specifically exactly how our earth has a magnetic field and the sun has an even crazier magnetic field. So we don't understand all the ins and outs of that. So that's called helioseismology. The observations dictate the models. Uh, one solution to neutrino problem was less helium in the core, but helioseismology ruled that out. That neutrino problem is the one I talked about us only getting one. Through helioseismology, we discovered that the original value of, of the opacity was too low. Uh, that's how we got to the 100,000 year mark. Uh, 
So the last part outside of the convection zone is the atmosphere. So the atmosphere is made up of the photosphere mostly, and it's called photos because that's the part we get to see. Uh, and then we have uh, outside of that is the chromosphere and chromos means color. And in fact, during an eclipse, that part looks kind of pinkish. And then there's the corona, which actually goes quite a bit further than this uh, diagram indicates, but yeah, it's the corona. So, and corona means crown, just like the corona beer means crown and the coronavirus uh, is called a coronavirus because if you look at the actual cells, it's got little spikes on it, like it's a crown. So we now have the core, the radiative zone, the convective zone, then we get to the atmosphere, which I said is the photosphere, and then outside of that is the chromosphere, and then outside of that is the corona. Uh, all of that, like I said, are known as the atmosphere. Now, here comes another mystery. So normally you build a fire out in the backyard, you're having a bonfire, at least us rednecks have bonfires, I don't know about all the other people, but we have bonfires and we sit next to the fire and next thing you know, our jeans are so hot that they're melting my leg hairs. So the first thing I do is I decide to move a little bit further away from the fire, right? And then that's good because then my, my the jeans uh, cool down, my leg hairs stop melting, and that's great. Well, that's the way things are supposed to work. The closer you are to the heat source, the hotter it should be. Well, if you look at the temperature through our atmosphere, notice in the photosphere, the temperature actually drops, 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 drops. But then it gets to the chromosphere and it rises just a little bit. That's kind of weird, but then it stays basically the same. So I can understand that. It's just the atmosphere trapping stuff, blah, blah, blah. But then check this out at about 2,100 kilometers up, it takes a huge jump and jumps up to a million Kelvin in the Corona. So that's like I moved uh, three feet away and I felt more comfortable. My leg hair stopped melting, but then I moved 20 feet away and it got so hot that my hair and skin actually melted. That's what's happening with the sun. So that's a big, you know, a big question now. What the heck is the sun doing? Well, we sort of have an answer to that. And we think we understand pretty well. Uh, you also notice, and this is part of the puzzle, the density does decrease slowly as you go down, go down, go down. But when you get to the corona, the density actually takes a, a, a sharp decrease to the corona. So that's a little clue of what's going to help us understand this temperature jumping up is this low, low, low density of the corona. The effective temperature of the photosphere is 5,780 Kelvin. And as you expect, the temperature does decrease, but the chromosphere uh, and then the corona make it kind of odd. Uh, the reason we, one of the reasons we can tell that the uh, photosphere is so thin is limb darkening. So limb is the, uh, the edge. If you look at this picture, for instance, see how it's a little darker along the edge? That's basically because that little thin part is us looking through a ch thicker chunk of atmosphere because if you're looking straight on you're just looking through the depth of the atmosphere but as you go here you're looking at an angle that's not perpendicular to this atmosphere right here so you have to go through this atmosphere then through the atmosphere uh, that would look perpendicular from the side and then out the other atmosphere so you look through all that thickness that tells you that it's fairly opaque and because we look through less material at the edges the sun appears actually darker so kind of kind of interesting, huh? This is what the spectra of the sun looks like. So you remember those uh, glasses I brought in for you and let you look at the light produced by uh, helium and hydrogen and stuff like that. Those were emission spectra. This is an actual absorption spectra. And the fact that the sun produces an absorption spectra tells us something already, because we know Kirchhoff's laws say that absorption spectra come from a hot, dense source uh, with a lower density, cooler substance in between the hot, dense source and us. So we know there must be something hot and dense be below the atmosphere. Duh, that turns out to be the core. And this is basically those dark lines would correspond to the bright lines you saw in class. So these dark lines are actually the lines reminiscent of various elements and compounds that exist in our sun. And there's over 70 of them. So that's what the spectra looks like. The chromosphere, as we said, is above the photosphere. It's higher temperature than the photosphere. It gives off a reddish emission line or spectrum. And notice it looks sort of pinkish during an eclipse. This is what I was talking about. And chromos means color. So uh, it gives off a reddish emission line spectrum. And remember, that's us looking along the edges. So it doesn't have the hot, dense core behind it. That's why it gives off an emission spectra. And the red color is what gives the name chromosphere to this region because the term means place where the color comes from. 
So the corona above the chromosphere has a temperature inversion. And like I said, it reaches one to two million Kelvin. It, at that temperature, that means the radiation it produces is actually x-rays. So, you know, if you stuck a, your leg in, in that area uh, and put a piece of uh, x-ray film on it, it would actually give you a picture of your bones, uh, sort of. Okay, and I'll say sort of because remember me telling you about how low density it was. It can extend out for several solar radii, so that's why I was telling you the, the corona is actually bigger than that little diagram suggested. And it's not visible with the naked eye unless you're looking during a solar eclipse. And it's actually kind of dangerous to just look at a solar eclipse. It's only when the sun is completely blacked out that you can look without harming your eyes. Uh, and I, even then, I tell you to, to do it with an experienced astronomer. Uh, to keep from, you know, going blind because we, we literally lose vision of hundreds of people a year due to staring at the sun during the eclipse. So the sun's atmosphere is very active. So check that out. That's a cool prominence. When, when a physicist sees lines like this, they look like loops. We automatically think magnetism. And that turns out to be a good guess here. Uh, if we saw straight lines, we'd think maybe electricity or gravity, but we see curved lines suggesting a closed loop and we always think magnetism. And that is it. And that's why this is a plasma as opposed to a gas. If, if you had a gas, a magnetic field wouldn't affect it very much uh, because it would make the individual atoms become sort of polarized, if you will. But other than that, it wouldn't cause their motion to change. This is actually magnetism causing the motion of this plasma to change. The sun's magnetic field structure uh, structures the atmosphere and causes the solar activity. The solar wind, which is the charged particles, uh, created mostly in the core uh, are, are basically flying away through coronal holes. So you have a hole in the corona uh, from a prominence or whatever, that's actually where the solar wind comes from and it's where magnetic fields extend away. So that previous picture, whatever side the sun's coming out or the, the energy's coming out of, I picture maybe coming out of here and going into here, that's a, a coronal hole. That's actually more in the chromosphere, but I think you get what I'm saying. Uh, so the solar wind is pushing out in all directions. Of course, you can even use that. To, it actually, there's a, a, a pressure that is associated with it. You could use it if you made a, a solar sail. You could use it to drive you away from our solar system uh, as opposed to jet fuel, stuff like that. But then in addition to that, the sun's magnetic field is so big and the sun's rotating so rapidly that that magnetic field drags behind and makes things behave in a, a less straightforward way. Uh, the sun actually does have a movement. Uh, the whole solar system, of course, is moving with it, but it's moving uh, in this diagram. It's moving to the right and Jupiter and Saturn and Mercury and Venus and all those things move with us. And we have the solar wind exterior, uh, extends all the way out to this uh, bubble, if you will. And then the magnetic effects stay all the way out to here. And we call this the bow shock or bow shock. Uh, so it pushes interstellar gas out of the path of the sun's motion. Uh, leaving this area is what uh, NASA considers leaving our solar system. And Voyager 1, I think Voyager 2 did that first. And Voyager 1 recently did that. See if I got another chat that came in. I think that's no, the same one. Okay. When I move my mouse, it, uh, I lose the ability to forward the slide. The sun is made of gas. Again, I'm telling you it's plasma. So it undergoes differential rotation. So it's sort of like if, if the earth acted like the sun, Miami would not always be, say, south of Cape Hatteras. Uh, since uh, Cape Hatteras is closer to the, or excuse me, since Miami is closer to the equator, Miami would probably rotate uh, a lot faster. So you'd actually get uh, eventually Miami being under Great Britain and North Carolina being way back behind. So that's what goes on with the sun. The, the uh, equator rotates way faster than the poles. Uh, it, so it has what we call differential rotation. The magnetic field goes through this material. Uh, uh, so because of differential rotation, it actually gets tangled. And the area where the magnetic fields gets knotted up are called sunspots. So this is how we think sunspots occurring, uh, actually occur. Let me check this chat real quick. I'll see someone else. No problem, Dennis. Sorry, missed you until now. And learn about so like hair smelting. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Younger, you never know what he's going to talk about. 
<laughs> All right. So uh, when you look at a sunspot, there's a umbra. That's the darkest spot. And then there's next to the umbra. That's what pin means as a prefix. So there's the pin umbra. And these are those granules I showed you earlier that I said would last, you know, five to 20 minutes and are about the size of Texas. Uh, this is what the sunspot would actually look like. Uh, and it's basically caused by a tangling of the magnetic field. I'll show you in some diagrams in a second. It'll make more sense what I'm talking about. But first thing you notice in this diagram, this is a plot of latitude versus time. And you see early in the uh, sunspot season, let's say this one right here, the sunspots are at higher latitudes. But as the season goes on, they get closer and closer to the equator. So that was sort of our first clue, one of our first clues. Not only that, you have a uh, almost no sunspots right around here. Notice it lines up with that. So there's almost no sunspots. And then we get a peak, and then it falls back down to no, con uh, no sunspots, and then a peak, and then it falls back down to no. So that pattern tells us something, too. The sun shows an approximate 11-year sunspot cycle, but what we're going to figure out is it's actually part of a 22-year cycle. And again, I'm going to explain that in a second. Uh, the solar maxima was when the sunspots are most active. And the Maunder minimum uh, showed an actual lack of sunspots from 1645 to 1750. And yes, we actually did have some weird uh, climate anomalies during that period. So uh, the sun's magnetic field turns out to flip every 11 years during the maximum of the sunspot cycle. So uh, the reason why it became a 22 year cycle is there's 11 years with the North Pole at the top and the South Pole at the bottom. And then it flips and there's another 11 years of the South Pole at the top and the North at the bottom. And then it flips back to where we started. That takes 22 years. So that's what's going on with that. Uh, the sunspots do come in pairs. Remember me telling you about whenever I see a closed loop, I think magnetism. Well, sunspots coming in pairs suggest to me a closed loop, like one hole would be something popping out and the other hole would be something going back in. Uh, that was, again, another clue in the fact that they start off at high latitudes and slowly move, move towards the equator of the sun uh, is more telling. Uh, so solar prominences uh, occur as well. They're hot rising gas in the chromosphere and are constrained by magnetic fields. Remember, these are hot gases, so it's plasma. Everything's charged. And basically, charged particles tend to spiral around magnetic field lines. So if you got magnetic field lines making like little loops, that means the little uh, charged particles that come out are going to go in little spirals or helixes around the uh, magnetic field line. Solar flares and coronal mass ejections are highly energetic, violent bursts and eruptions. They correlate with sunspots. So we know uh, at least the sunspots allows the solar flares to exit and the coronal mass ejections as well. Uh, here's some um, uh, looking at uh, other stars and, and things like that. It turns out that uh, other stars have uh, sunspots and stuff as well, our solar spots. So the effect of solar activity on Earth is called space weather. And solar activity change, oh, this wasn't the right one, I'm sorry. I was, I was thinking this was the diagram of other planets, but no, uh, this is just all about space weather. So solar activity changes slightly over time. Solar storms can disrupt electric power grids and satellites and uh, basically a solar flare or coronal mass ejection could really do wreak a lot of havoc on us. Uh, basically every time a big burst of charged particles comes through, it creates currents in our electronics and our electronics have to be prepared for that. Uh, the good news is we usually see a photon signal about eight minutes after something like that happens. And then the uh, particles move at, you know, five or 600 me uh, kilometers per second. So they're moving quite a bit slower. So we got a little bit of lead time. We can take precautions. And then also every time we see a really bad solar storm or something like that, we redesign our satellites to make sure they can handle something maybe two to 10 times as powerful as that. And then we put up new satellites and uh, slowly we hopefully eventually get to a design that can withstand all of them that will ever happen. But, you know, we don't know how big th something can be. So that could be in question. So let me show you what I wanted to about uh, the sunspots and how they occur and how magnetism is related to it. Uh, that used to be a slide in this book, but it's not anymore. So I'm going to show it to you via drawing. So instead of sharing my screen, I'm going to stop share 
And now I'm going to go back to changing it to my document cam and I'll explain what's going on here uh, with the sunspots. So what we have is a sun. I'm going to make this video highlight uh, my video anyways. Let me see. Spotlight video. Make sure that's nice and focused. Okay, that doesn't look too bad. All right, so the sun, you can imagine, is a big sphere like this. The problem is it rotates differentially. What I mean by that is the equator, this little particle in the equator will move that far, whereas this little particle up here, let's say right here, will only move that far. And this little particle up here might only move that far. And then, of course, it reverses again down here. So you get further away from the equator, it goes slower, slower, so on and so forth. That's differential rotation. So if you imagine that the magnetic fields that are created uh, by the sun are actually taking part in the sun, the magnetic field lines should come out of the north and go straight across here into the south. And there'd be another one over here and another one over here, so on and so forth like that. Well, the problem is this stuff is not all rotating at the same rate. So this part of this magnetic field is going to instead do a little number like this. It's going to slowly start to wrap around this way. And as time goes by, it's like a 29 day cycle. As time goes by, that thing ends up stretching further and further around until eventually it even comes back around here like that. When magnetic field lines get closer together, that means the magnet magnetism stronger and there's some maximum limit to how much matter can handle far as the strength of a magnetic field. So what we see is these lines getting closer and closer together at the high latitudes first. So that explained or gave us a hint as why the uh, sunspots started at higher latitudes because those were the one the magnetic field lines got closest together and therefore strongest at. <coughs> so sort of what it is, it's like the materials breaking down that holds the magnetic field. So the magnetic field bulges out and pops up back in like that. That's the sunspot. Now over time, that really dense magnetic region will get closer and closer to the equator. So you have them here and so on and so forth. Then when it's all said and done, it the whole surface or the whole atmosphere of the sun will get completely saturated so it can't hold any magnetic field anymore and the magnetic field just flips. And then we start the whole process over again, only now the, no the top is the south and the bottom is the north. So this takes about 11 years. This takes about 11 years. And in the end, uh, it's a 22 year cycle. Does that make sense? So that really is what's the cause of, or what we, as best we can tell, what is the cause of the uh, sunspots and why they occur in 11 years and stuff like that. So that's about it. Uh, now's the time where you can ask me questions or you're free to go, uh, whichever one you want. Tyree did come in. Let me get the roll, make sure I didn't miss anybody. Tyree came in. Camille came in. I should really use a different color pen. Camille came in. And I think that was it. Oh, Cameron came in. All right, well, you folks are free to go. I got all your roll, uh, but you're also free to stick around if you have any questions. I'm getting ready to stop recording in case anybody has any questions. Uh, that way it won't be a, a private thing. Or a, a private thing will stay private as opposed to being recorded. So I'm gonna kill that now and then I'll wait for all of y'all to leave before I go. Have a good one, stay safe. Uh, remember, you got a test opened up. You want to get that knocked out, uh, and the final will be next week.